almost every autoimmune disease that we have today is related to the dysbiosis of our microbiota. Again, we were talking earlier about multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes. Crohn's disease and IBS and C. diff infections have increased dramatically. Uh, what they're finding, though, that if you get a healthy inoculum from another individual and do a fecal matter transplant, and this is great before lunch, sorry, <laughs> that people that have suffered for decades with this, that have had operations, resections of intestines, that have tried every avenue, and some people have died from this, that some of them within 24 hours, they can be cured with the right biological community restored back into their system. We get extinction events in our stomach microbiota from the, what we eat. You do a fecal matter transplant, it's immediately black and functioning. So what we're thinking is, this works in humans. We know what we've done in agriculture has destroyed the microbial community. Can we do this in agricultural soils? Can we just do an inoculation of microbes to bring these systems back? Let's look at how nature has this set up. There's a ladder of succession that is developed on this planet from a bare soil parent material to your old growth forest. You can see there's a change from a predominantly bacterial to predominantly fungal. As you also increase net primary productivity from about 90 grams of dry biomass up to 2200 grams. This is what a bacterial dominant soil looks like. Layer after layer of layer of bacteria. That's a California rice field. This is what a healthy agricultural soil should look like. You have your organic matter here with fungi that have completely covered it. You have your bacteria. This is what the red, Muir Redwood Forest in California looks like. You can see a lot of organic matter, very few bacteria, and that's covered with fungi. We in agriculture are here. We do weeds really well. Now, weeds are a misnomer. Weeds are there for a purpose. They are there to improve that soil, to move that soil up to the next level. But we keep disturbing it, and we keep having weeds. We need to be here, about one to one, in order to grow the crops that we like to eat. But we also have to understand, to stay at that point on the ladder, agriculture is controlled disturbance. This is what nature used to develop those deep carbon, high carbon percent soils. The, the bison were kept in tight herds by the predators. They were moved along pretty quickly. They could only harvest about 30% of the forage that was available. They would stomp the rest of it in. They would deposit their dung. The dung would be rolled up in a small ball by dung beetles placed in the ground, basically composting in place. So what you have is this herd of inoculators going across the prairies, inoculating every time they go past. How can we mimic this system on agricultural land? If we start to bring this system back, this is Nancy Rainey, Corona, New Mexico, about 12 inches of rain a year. In the last decade, she's gone from three species of grasses to 45. She reduced her medicine bill by 90%, reduced supplemental feed bills by 66%. It originally built swales to capture water for stock tanks. She changed the dynamics of the soils so much for as far as infiltration and holding capacity that they no longer fill up. Her aquifer water tables are rising, and she's, her grasslands recovered in a total drought. Alejandro Curillo, in the Chihuahuan Desert, south of us, about nine inches of rain. He's improved his plant diversity, his stocking rate, bird diversity, and native animal population. This used to be when the Spaniards came through belly high to a horse with grass. And yet, with our grazing techniques, we could completely destroy it. But what he's done is bring it back. He went from 250 acres per cow to 20 acres to support one cow and restored the grasslands. This, in order to put, implement this into agriculture where we did not have the animals, we developed a composting process. Most of the composting is done with windrow, and you do not end up with a very fungal dominant compost. This is a static composting system. It's no turn. The lazy man's way to do it. It's available on YouTube if you want to do this. But it solved one of the big problems with dairy manure for USDA. It dropped the salinity of that substrate from 33 to 40 millisiemens down to less than three. But most importantly, it gave a fungal dominant and biologically diverse compost. 
This is the texture of that compost. It's a lot like a clay. We see at four weeks this kind of diversity in the top 80% of the microbial community. At 22 weeks, when everybody says it's done, let's put it out. Okay, this is 60 weeks. There's a four times increase in diversity over this time period if you allow this compost to mature. It becomes inoculant at that point and not a nutrient amendment. I was originally an MPK junkie. I'm about 14 years reformed now. Because <laughs> I thought, okay, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, it's all about that. Nitrogen didn't correlate to plant growth. Phosphorus did not correlate to plant growth. Potassium didn't correlate to plant growth. Okay, I was like, all right, it's got to be organic matter. No. Organic motor matter is important, but it is not what's going on here. We had looked at a fungal to bacterial ratio. Biology is key. Let's look at what happens as you move from a bacterial dominant, low carbon soil to a high carbon, fungal dominant soil. Where does the carbon that a plant captures go? Photosynthate was partitioned into the root carbon, the brown piece of the pie, the shoot carbon, the green piece, and the fruit carbon. We also looked at new soil carbon over and above what soil carbon we started with, the carbon that was respired, and as well, the flow of carbon into nitrogen fixation. You can see in a low fertility, low carbon, bacterial dominant soil, 3% of the energy that plant captured and turned to photosynthates goes to the plant. The rest of it went into the soil. 97% of the energy that plant captured was pushed into the soil. It must be important for a plant to do that. That's not a good survival technique. As you move up, you can see 17%, 21%, 30% into the root, shoot, and fruit of the plant, all the way up to 56%. Now, we're right here in agriculture. Low carbon, bacterial dominant, we're about 11% efficiency. We should be able to, according to this, increase the productivity of these soils five times. Inoculation rates for these trials started at 400 pounds per acre. So you can see on this white square, it's just a dusting of compost. So the compost was used as a microbiological inoculant, not a nutrient resource. This trial explored the potential of plant growth on desert soils, one that has no legacy issues from previous agricultural practices. Cover crops were grown on this soil, harvested and hauled off, and another crop was planted. This was to explore the capacity of an inoculated soil microbial community's potential to promote plant growth.